you for the introduction, and um, thank you so much for having us. Thanks, Mirna and Lucas, for the invitation, and um, thanks to all the great speakers that we've seen today. It's been really inspiring um, day. I would say, particularly uh, the last the last lecture was. I think we really responded to that very 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 strongly and found a lot of. Um, themes in it that were kind of existentially managing and then also practically managing. So it was really, um, yeah, I, I, we feel like it was a really good uh, connect, connection, I think, programming connection. Um, we're going to produce, uh, to present this um, bigger project that we're working on called Universal Syntax. And, um, I guess we've been slowly developing the terms of the project over the last year and a half, let's say. Um, but it's still very much in its, in its uh, infancy. And uh, it's great to be here in this context to kind of project it into the future and talk about what, we're, what we've been doing. OK, so we'll jump in. Um... In 1869, Dmitry Mendeleev published the periodic table. It was the first comprehensive classifications of chemical elements and their properties. In the 150 years since its publication, the periodic table has been subject to various modifications, but the principles guiding its structure have remained essentially unchanged. Mendeleev's discovery of the general structure of the table allowed him to see it as a comprehensive whole and therefore predict the existence of as yet undiscovered elements as well as their properties. Once the basic logic of the grid was determined, he was able to reveal gaps between the known elements at the time. While Mendeleev is known to have said that the Mende um, sorry, we, in Russian we call it the Mendeleev table, <laughs> that the periodic table came to him in a dream, his close friendship with the Sanskrit scholar Otto von Bertling provides some historical context for how the periodic table came into being. Bertling was at the time preparing the second edition of his book on the fourth century BC Sanskrit scholar Panini. Panini is considered to be the father of linguistics. He was the first person to create a comprehensive diagrammatic grammatical structure of Sanskrit and of any language for that matter, part of which we're looking at here. His work remained the foundation of linguistics all the way to the 19th century, which is over two millennia. The two-dimensional arrangement that Mendeleev used for his periodic table is based on the two-dimensional arrangement that Panini used to categorize Sanskrit sounds and their contextual relations. The comprehensiveness of Panini's diagram is what enabled Mendeleev to imagine his system as comprehensive, as a view of all possible elements, and therefore identify and fill the missing ones which he gave Sanskrit names an indirect acknowledgement of this influence. So on the one hand, we have a comprehensive system that organizes the principles of language. The feature of human activity that perhaps most distinguishes us from other life forms because it allows us to create abstract constructs. On the other hand, we have the periodic table comprehensive system of chemical elements that we understand to constitute absolutely everything in the material universe. The structure of the properties and relations of the elements that the periodic table illustrates far, far pre-exists human or any other life, not to mention human thought, by some 13 billion years. Now this is assuming we're correct about the age of the universe and that we're not dead wrong about the periodic table. This completely unrelated conflation of forms might create a sense of arbitrariness to how we interpret and organize the world. But the periodic table is remarkably real insofar as it's remarkably functional. Think of everything that's allowed us to invent for better or worse. So how is it that this system that classifies elements that are so independent from human touch was derived from a specifically human construct as abstract as grammar? So this strange episode in the history of science is quite awe-inspiring to us. Um, and at the same time, it's not at all unique in terms of the ways that language and metaphor um, have throughout our entire history come together to construct our perception of the natural world. 
um, our project Universal Syntax to begin from a very broad um, and general description is focused on this human tendency to read the natural world as a text and to consider ourselves its translators or decoders. This strange conflation is found in every fold of the history of science, such as um, the example of the periodic table we were just describing. So, of course, not, neither of us are historians of science. Um, we, we came to this research trajectory as, as filmmakers um, with some back research background. But <laughs> yeah. um, and so in, as filmmakers, the way we started discussing our collaboration was through our mutual fascination with how moving image is perpetually reconfiguring our perceptual boundaries. And so this interest in, um, and I guess need to historicize perception um, inevitably led us to various chapters in the history, in the histories of science. Um, perception, much like filmmaking, is always ecological in that it occurs on various thresholds, but primarily the threshold between our bodies and our surroundings. Um, and for this reason, it's very, kind of very tightly related um, to the evolution of natural science. Our filmmaking practice is about creating experimental frameworks that materialize these connections that we're making across the history of science, media, ecology. Um, what we're particularly interested in is how this conflation of text and our perception of the natural world opens ways to investigate how matter, language, and perception are deeply, if not perhaps inseparably, entangled. For Galileo, the world was one epic book. One had to learn to read the heavens. Its alphabet was the stars. In his words, the book of the heavens is, quote, always open before our eyes, but we can't understand it without first applying ourselves to understanding the language and learning the characters used for writing it, end quote. For Athanasius Kircher, the, um, the the 17th century Jesuit scholar and naturalist, nature was a terrain of secrets written in a coded language. As one of the first Europeans to decipher ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, he thought of himself as, quote, a modern Hermes who had restored order to the world, end quote. His ability to decipher hieroglyphs was the basis upon which he claimed the authority to unlock all of nature's secrets. Um, uh, through his other taxonomic work, he was an extensive taxonomizer. Um, Francis Bacon, uh, the father of the scientific method and the instigator of the scientific re revolution, first worked as a lawyer. Um, he likewise understood causes of natural things as secret and applied methodologies acquired from legal practice um, to, uh, to define scientific fact as based on evidence and repetition. He searched for, quote, natural laws on the basis of written laws. Here are, it's in countless examples, I mean, this, the list goes on and on and on, um, and we're kind of painting in broad strokes a general tendency that we're interested in. Um, the metaphor of the written word is directly proportionate to the boundaries of the perceivable and therefore the knowable world. In fact, ancient Assyrian and Babylonian cuneiform tablets that detail observational practices show us that the tendency to read the world as a text even precedes the concept of nature, um, which I guess, according to a lot of the histories that we've read, would kind of be situated in ancient Greece in contrast to the way it was being talked about earlier today, but that's like an interest, I mean, there's all kinds of angles to that, I guess. Um, from antiquity to the present day, we're unable to escape the housing of perception within the metaphor of language. Early geneticists, of course, viewed DNA as a book of instructions for constructing human life. And as Lily Kay wrote in her book, Who Wrote the Book of Life, the conflation of genetics and information is, in her words, quote, a metaphor for a metaphor, and thus a signifier without a referent. She writes that every age employs new forms of symbolic exchange through the metaphor of text, but every period always rehistoricizes the metaphor within complex and overlapping and often irrational layers, combining old and new meanings. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, the issue of metaphor obviously goes in all kinds of directions. Um, the, the, the text that we wrote for the publication talks about how things derived from science um, are used as metaphors for other social or narrative 
practices and that we're kind of a bit more familiar with, but then what our project is really focused on is how metaphor and language are kind of really in, interwoven in the kind of fabric of scientific observation as well. Um, so the ways in which the invention of print, for example, wrapped language and the ways that language is wrapped electronically, of course, mean completely different things in terms of the subject's configuration of the world and what language means as a metaphor in that kind of given constellation. But at the same time, these are linked by the fact that they are still bound by the inescapability of that metaphor and our inability to perceive the world without mediation. Our project is driven by a certain sense of awe towards the usually seamless ways that metaphor is woven into the fabric of perception. Um, Jose Ortega y Gasset wrote um, about almost 100 years ago that, quote, metaphor is probably the most fertile of the, res the resources available to us, as all other faculties keep us enclosed within the real, within what already is, end quote. Um, the complexity and seeming contradiction of metaphor lies partially in the fact that we use metaphor as a tool with which to escape the real, and at the same time that we are constantly literalizing metaphors in our construction of the real. It is essentially impossible to imagine what the, uh, what the absence of metaphor would mean in our perception of the world. So metaphor can be thought of as a tool that takes us beyond the real into the realm of the otherwise unthinkable or unimaginable. And in doing so, it transforms the world. Moving image since its very emergence has also been, quote, transforming the world in a manner specific to itself, in the words of Pazi Valiajo. The ability of film to remodel perceptual frameworks has been analyzed since the very beginning of cinema. And one of the ways it has been theorized is also through applying the metaphor of language to film. There have, for example, been numerous attempts to outline a grammar of film where um, a shot would be equated with a letter, a, or rather, I'm sorry, a frame with a letter, a shot with a word, a sequence with a sentence, etc., in ascending order of complexity. And although the comparison can ring true in certain instances, it doesn't stand up under scrutiny because a shot or even a single frame often contain an infinite amount of pictorial detail. In film, unlike in language, or indeed in some sciences, we can't determine the smallest unit of meaning. Moreover, attempts to define the grammar of film often resemble more of a vocabulary of possible shots and their functions than an actual linguistic system. Now, perhaps ironically, now that we're moving on to this kind of more visual part of our talk, um, we're not going to have any visuals. Um, and we spent some time trying to think of how best to image this, um, but in fact, some examples are going to come later in the talk once we've grounded them more. So you'll just have to um, use your imaginations. Um, so film doesn't have a grammar as such, but what we're kind of trying to think in terms of is that it has a syntax. Well, grammar concerns the establishment of rules in order to create a predetermined foundation for the use of a language, syntax emerges organically. Syntax is where two or more things meet and create new meanings out of their juxtaposition. So in this sense, it's useless to speak of a film grammar, but of film syntax, because film is about the relations between things, between one shot and the next, between the screen and the spectator, between metaphor and perception. The function of film syntax is to organize both space and time. So unlike in um, written or spoken language that operates only sequentially, in film, syntax concerns both the sequential development and shaping of time through the editing rhythm of the shots, and the shaping of spatial composition through the mise-en-scene and movement within each shot. Syntax, both in film and elsewhere, is at its core an issue of rhythm, movement, and scale. Most importantly, the syntax of film is the result of its usage, not a determinant of it. We discover syntax in the process of experimenting with the medium. Syntax and film evolved organically as certain devices, codes, technological conditions, and cultural developments coalesced in workable and useful ways. Syntax is never static or definitive. It exists in flux and is in a constant state of change and development, emerging from within the relations between the networks of factors at play. The organic evolution of different forms of syntax 
meaning the energetic charges that bind two or more things together, um, makes it interesting for us to think about possibilities of, for applying the notion of syntax to the non-human. While animals are thought not to possess grammar, um, there are ongoing debates surrounding whether some animals develop syntax in their com communication. Whether or not one chooses to attribute syntax to animals or even potentially to bacteria, we could think of that maybe potentially in relation to the, um, to the microorganism opera we, we saw today. P potentially there's some kind of way to think about syntax in relation to microorganisms. Um, but, the, but the way that we, w whether or not we choose to attribute syntax to, to something outside of ourselves has everything to do with how syntax, language, and communication are defined. As we know, the definitions of these terms have been completely fluid and, and, and adaptable throughout history, and they've often served as metaphors that are used to expand our ability to interpret the natural world. Um, our understanding of DNA, of course, for example, would be completely different if we hadn't understood enzyme transcription in terms of communication and information. For the purposes of our films and research, we're adopting a quite expanded definition of syntax which might understandably confound linguists, um, but which could account for the tendency of life, both human and non-human, to create organic forms of rhythmic organization. Um, both the words organic and organize have the same etymological roots deriving from, from the Latin organum and Greek organicos, um, meaning relating to an organ or an instrument. This way that we've been developing our understanding of syntax is about occupying thresholds between various states and processes, um, between film and science, between the human and non-human, subject, object, between the individual and the multiple. Um, syntax is that which occupies the porous space between such definitions. Considering syntax from this position also provides ways to consider how our own forms of organization as humans emerge directly from the world as it exists prior to our own intervention. Um, this angle could potentially open um, an understanding of this, the, the, what we understand as qu this quite uncanny way that the structure that lay the foundation for linguistics that was developed by, by Panini in the fourth century BC um, is also the same structure that is able to account for what we understand at this moment to be everything in the material universe. How, how, is, how, how, how are those things so interchangeable? This is kind of totally fast, fascinating to, to us. And thinking about syntax as opposed to, say, something superimposed like grammar is a kind of way to begin discussing those, those questions. So in this short time, we've obviously brought up quite a broad range of issues that are separated from each other by space and time. These streams throughout the history of science um, are, of course, very different from each other, but they're related to our project through the specific ways that they contribute to perceptual models of the world, prisms that we use to map um, certain forms of understanding onto ourselves, uh, onto our surroundings, and each of these distinct chapters has its own syntactic relations. The syntax of ancient Assyrian observational practices is as different from early modern taxonomic practice structures um, as these are from the syntax of genetics. Each of these frameworks have their own vocabularies, rhythms, scales, and these build kind of integrated full worlds um, in, unto themselves. In one way, our project is about learning and mapping these rhythms, patterns, and modes of juxtaposition and translating them into the syntax of the film, adopting them into our own language that's distinct from, 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 from these, but that, that kind of draw from them, um, where we try to create, wait for it, a corporeal interface to different epistemological realities. Um, this shouldn't be confused, of course, with some kind of rigid overriding system. We don't have a set of rules that we do this kind of mapping with, um, but this is a mode of associative thinking um, that guides us in the infinite decisions that one makes um, in, in conceiving of a project, filming it, editing it, um, like syntax, the cinematic syntax that we're working with emerges organically through these processes of exploration and experiment. So we're currently working on the 
first film in this series called A Demonstration. Um, this film specifically kind of predates the emergence of the project of a whole and um, it's kind of the, the root of the project. Uh, when we started research and development for it, we kind of immediately felt the, the wealth of um, kind of themes and historical trajectories that it was immersing us in couldn't be contained in this one work. Um, and thus became kind of the kernel of the project developing. Um, when we first started thinking about collaborating, even the common interests that we wanted to explore were things like how the invisible is given form, the shifting boundary of the human body, the emergence of knowledge regimes and narrative forms, and the persistence of a decentralized history in the fabric of the present. Um, and this film and this project as a whole kind of touches on all of these. So a demonstration enters the broader theme and universal syntax of the historicization of perception from the periphery. The first spark for the film was learning that there were extensive taxonomies of monsters in late Renaissance and early modern science. We first encountered the Monstrorum Historia, which we're looking at here, which was collected and produced by Ulisse Aldrovandi, um, a famous Bolognese scholar who was one of the most influential and prolific um, naturalists and taxonomers of his period. And the existence of taxonomies of monsters initially struck us as an oxymoron. Intuitively, we understood the monstrous as something outside the boundaries of the known or perceivable. So how could image, imagined monsters be subject to taxonomic classification? And how did this play such a central role in late Renaissance and early modern science? We understood these classifications of monsters to both undermine and substantiate the very idea of a taxonomy. And this became the prism for the rest of our research for the film. Now, any contradictions that we had initially perceived were dissolved as we learned about the complex nuances involved in this chapter in the history of Western science. Um, the etymology of the word monster provides some clues in itself. Monster comes from the Latin monstrare, which means to demonstrate, to show, and to reveal. Um, and monsters, in fact, for medieval and Renaissance subjects, were seen as sign and signs and portents, as a direct messages from God that needed to be interpreted. So if we consider uh, monsters as messages, the attempt to classify them within taxonomic frameworks no longer poses any contradiction. As demonstrations, we can think of the classification of monsters as classifications of messages, a syntactic endeavor. The description of a Ravenna monster, which we're looking at now, by a Florentine man in 1512, provides a good example of the way such demonstrations that the monsters were, were read. He writes, it had a horn on its head, straight up like a sword, and instead of arms, it had two wings like a bat's, and at the height of the breast, it had a feo on one side and a cross on the other, and lower down at the waist, two serpents, and it was hermaphrodite, and on the right knee it had an eye, and its left foot was like an eagle's. Another contemporary chronicler related these deformities to particular moral failings. The horn indicates pride, the wings mental frivolity and inconstancy, the lack of arms, the lack of good works, the raptor's foot, rapaciousness, usury, and every sort of avarice. The eye on the knee, a mental orientation toward, solely toward earthly things, the double sex sodomy. The taxonomization of monsters was largely reliant on the circulation of written reports and visual representations of monstrous prodigies. The speed and breadth of the circulation grew in relation to the technological means available. And the history of monsters is inextricably bound with the history of media technologies. With the invention and accessibility of the printing press, news of monsters, such as the Ravenna monster, could spread faster and to a much greater audience. Suddenly, monsters were present throughout people's everyday lives, through broadsheets, and what had once been the subject of local rumors was broadcast, so to speak. The news of monsters now came from all sides, this multiplication and presence of monsters made people feel that they were living in times ridden with increasingly urgent divine warnings, warnings which were, of course, being issued by the printing press, not a high power. The way that these media events reconfigured the everyday fabric of perception, to include the monstrous, led people to feel that they were living in particularly apocalyptic times. <laughs> 
One of the changes brought on by the ability to reproduce images and text mechanically that's most significant to this kind of media history that we're creating with monsters um, is that disparate beings and objects were made essentially weightless um, and in a, to a certain sense interchangeable um, when encountered as graphic illustrations on a printed page. Um, this kind of flattening of the material world suddenly allows often incommensurate things um, to be collaged in new ways that would have been previously unimaginable. These are some kind of good examples of that collaging of different elements. Um, and of course, hybrids have existed throughout, throughout history. Um, but the late Renaissance brought about new forms of collaged beings, ones where very distinct symbolic and affective characteristics could be isolated and essentially cut and pasted together. In a lot of ways, this, it kind of has strong parallels with the transformations we've experienced over the last few decades with the internet, which has also kind of flattened a lot of the material world in a certain way, at least in terms of how we um, intake it and has kind of created a certain horizontality um, in terms of a, as, a, as a value scale where you know, various in, different incommensurate things, irrespective of origin, historical weight, cultural value, are, are made interchangeable to a degree. And you know, it's kind of, historical parallels are always a bit weird, but it's kind of, it's very tempting to think about these monsters and, as, as memes today. Um, and both memes of these, and these representations of monsters enter an existing cultural milieu where, uh, with a syntax of their own. Their messages only insofar as we assume the receiver has the necessary vocabulary to interpret them. So to get this meme, I need to have a set of pre-existing cultural references, and I have to be able to interpret this knowledge both visually and textually to reconfigure each of them individually. Um, the printed monsters would have really functioned, would have functioned in a really kind of quite similar way. Um, each symbolic property in the monster would have touched an entire cultural, spiritual, ethical framework of association. So the monsters, these, these demonstrations and revelations emerge from within, from inside the media technology. They demonstrate not so much the perceivable world as the means of perception and transmission of messages within a given perceptual ecology. And this is true of every media technological revolution, whether the, adm the advent of photography or cinema, radio, TV, internet, etc. Each of these revo re revolutions in communication breed their own very specific types of monsters, um, which could be seen as revelations of the liminal space between sender and receiver, between signal and noise. Um, here it is also a question of syntax, not grammar. These media monsters don't emerge from some preconceived set of rules. Um, they grow organically, developing and organizing their relational characteristics from within the fabric of communication and perception. In making the film, and we'll show some parts, some, some elements of it in, in a second as we round up, um, we spent really a lot of time trying to understand what the basic elements of this perceptual framework might be in terms of features such as rhythm, pattern, and scale, and to figure out how to translate these into the syntax of our film, essentially using film as a way to embody a perceptual reality that's unimaginably different from our own, and this can't be emphasized enough. Uh, you know, it's a, you know, the, the, the more re kind of research we did, the more we realized that, like, there's really, it's very hard to imagine what it would have been to, like, to live you know, in the late 16th, early 17th century. <laughs> um, in terms of the late Renaissance, early modern scientific practice and its relation to the monstrous, we identified three useful for us main characteristics of that syntax. Um, and these were visual analogy, the cut, and what we were calling radical inclusion. Oh, whoops, sorry, I haven't been turning pages. Um, so first, visual analogy was one of the guiding factors for scientific observation up until the scientific revolution in the 17th century. For late Renaissance naturalists such as Luis Aldrovandi, the so-called secrets of nature were dis disclosed by detecting visible signs in the surfaces and textures of things. 
These observations were used to create systems of resemblances and networks of analogies and similitudes. In this way, a man's body was compared to the body of a tree, human skin, the bark, etc. Through visual analogy and the boundaries between um, through visual analogy, the boundaries between categories such as human, animal, plant, and mineral were in fact quite ambivalent and fluid, and the monsters occupied precisely those fluid boundaries. Our aim in the making of the film has been to try to create a perceptual world where the analogous is real and where boundaries are constantly being negotiated, dissolved, and reconstructed in unexpected ways. Um, our second major formal guiding principle was the cut. Um, one of the things we were most interested in in our research um, was the fact that most of the naturalists collecting and classifying specimens um, were first trained as surgeons and physicians. So the need to create taxonomies um, of, of, of plants and other things in the natural world came from the need to be able to discern and apply their medicinal properties. So you need to know what's healthy and what's poisonous, and this is why you need to start categorizing things in the natural world. Um, so the drive to classify the natural world was inseparable from the exploration opening up of the human body. Um, so, and, you know, in a sense, monsters, or what we're calling kind of the monsters, emerged kind of at, the, at that intersection um, uh, in, in the kind of cutting of the human body and the cutting apart of the natural world. Um, and the film focuses on gestures and architectures in which this parallel cutting occurred. The, here you can see one example of the anatomical theater. Um, there's, there's various other sites that we explored in the film. Um, and at the same time, we're kind of incorporating those architectures into um, the materiality and physicality um, of the film itself, of its kind of spatio-temporal structure, which is, of course, kind of the, the, the cut in film is kind of the basic, basic gesture of film. Okay. And finally, we come up with the term radical inclusion as a guide to the ways we film material, taking a cue from Aldrovandi's approach to collecting and classifying specimens. His lifetime goal, one he imagined he could achieve, was to collect and classify the entirety of the natural world. In his hubristic drive for a comprehensive picture of the world, Aldrovandi included all kinds of information that was often irrelevant to the object of study. His taxonomies included stuff on the basis of all kinds of criteria, many of which would be ridiculed and discredited within a century. Once these disparate things are gathered within a certain framework, a certain kind of order emerges in a sort of fanciful and idiosyncratic syntax in its own quite unscientific way. <laughs> It is in this spirit that we collected material for the film, from choosing the locations to what and how we chose to shoot within them. Rather than attempting to gather footage that would illustrate a preconceived idea, we tried to allow the structure to grow organically. The historian Paula Findlin, whose book Possessing Nature is one of the classic works on early modern taxonomic practices, referred to the obsessive collection of specimens characteristic of this time as being driven by an attempt to construct a universal syntax of the world. For us, this term universal syntax, which we borrowed as the title of the project, was so compelling because, as we tried to show in this lecture, it speaks to a whole range of processes involved in the construction of perceptual frameworks throughout time. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.